The Lord be with you. It is a joy to be in worship with you this morning at Union Church of Hinsdale on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Today is the day when we remember love. The love that God has for us, which is so abundant that God became human so that we could feel that love up close. And today we remember the love that we can share with one another when we choose to follow in the ways of Christ. These past few weeks at Union Church, we've been focusing on how the first Christmas happened anyway. Happened despite unplanned pregnancy, travel complications, and no room at the inn. But I learned something interesting this week. Apparently, there really was room at the inn that first Christmas night. There just wasn't room for Mary and Joseph. You see, within ancient Near Eastern cultures, no innkeeper would have been caught dead with an inn at full capacity. Because what if a king suddenly came through town seeking a place to stay? You wouldn't want to be known forevermore as the innkeeper who had to turn away a king. So, every innkeeper in town would have had a spare room because they would have been prepared to host a king in the best room of all. If a king had shown up accompanied by attendants and dressed in royal robes, you better believe those innkeepers would have fought it out to be the one to host the royal guests. Every innkeeper in town would have been prepared for a king. But when Mary and Joseph knocked on doors that night, those innkeepers failed to recognize the king that was about to be born. The season of Advent is about waiting for a king and preparing ourselves to recognize him when he arrives. You see, God has always been present with God's people, but God took human form those 2,000 years ago because God knows that sometimes we need a God we can see and hear and touch. And God loves us so much that God gives us what we need. In these final days leading up to Christmas, there are lots of opportunities to prepare ourselves to recognize God. Here at Union Church, we will have an in-person Christmas Eve service it will be brief and it will be outdoors and socially distanced. If you would like to attend, you can gather in the courtyard at 6 p.m. There will also be a traditional Lessons and Carols Christmas Eve service online. It will stream at 8 p.m. and then again at 11 p.m. But you definitely don't want to miss our first ever virtual Christmas pageant on Zoom at 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Our kids and our families have been working hard to make this event possible. So please tune in to show your support and to experience the Christmas story in a whole new way. Of course, if all of this sounds a little too cheery for your taste this year, that's okay too. The holidays can always be hard, and this year has been especially hard. 
So if you want to participate in a service that attends to the grief and the loneliness of this season, I encourage you to attend our longest night service. I will lead this service over Zoom, and you can tune in at 7 p.m. on Monday, December 21. That day is the shortest day of the year, but together we can make the night feel a little less long. There are many reasons to grieve and many reasons to hope this Christmas season, because the light of the world is about to be born. Now, let us light our fourth Advent candle. When I look around our world today, I see estrangement and hatred fueled by leaders who would have us believe it is us versus them. Wars are waged around the world and at home, and we forget there is another way. When I look within myself, I recognize my own fear of connection. I pride myself on my independence because it is easier than relying on others and admitting I long to be cared for. But today we light the candle a love anyway, because we still hear the echoes of the promise God made those many years ago. Let these candles of hope, peace, joy, and love proclaim to all, Emmanuel, God's love is coming to dwell among us just as it already is in heaven. So be not afraid for God's love is close at hand.
Will you join me in this morning's prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ, our God is a generous, merciful, and forgiving God. When we are honest before the divine, forgiveness is freely offered. Forgiveness to go and sin no more. To go and love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgiveness to go and build God's kingdom of justice, love, mercy, and peace. The peace of Christ be with you. I would like to now invite you to greet your neighbors with signs of this peace, whether that's turning to someone in the room next to you, sending a text to a friend, or dropping a line here in our chat box. Scripture reading for today is heartbreaking. Matthew is the only one of the four Gospels that tells us this story, and basically we wish he too had left it out. Reverend Mike will say more about this story in his sermon, but as we listen to this passage, perhaps we can at least be reminded how important it is to remember our story truthfully. From the second chapter of Matthew, immediately after the holy men from Iran departed from Bethlehem and avoided going back to King Herod, lest they give away the identity of the newborn king. Now, when the holy men had departed, a messenger of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a vision and said, Be alert! Take the child and his mother and get yourselves to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Thus alerted, Joseph took the child and his mother at night and went to Egypt and stayed there until the death of Herod. This fulfilled what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod realized the holy men had treated him with contempt, he was wrathful, and giving the order, he slaughtered all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under, according to the time he had learned from the holy men. This fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A son was heard in Ramah, wailing, lamentation, and anguish. Rachel mourning for her children, she could not be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, behold, a messenger of the Lord appeared in a vision to Joseph in Egypt, and said, 
Be alert, take the child and his mother, and get yourself to the land of Israel, for the ones seeking to kill the child are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But still, when he heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, was ruling over the Jerusalem region in place of his father, Joseph was afraid to go there. So after being alerted in a vision, he went much further north, to the district of Galilee. He made his home in a village called Nazareth, which fulfilled the words of the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Thanks be to God for these truthful words of life. Please pray with me. Dear God, uh, dear God, we are heartbroken over these children murdered by King Herod. Although it was so many years ago, their deaths are remembered in our sacred story, so they bring us grief still. We think of their families and all their neighbors in Bethlehem, understandably inconsolable. We think of those who have shared that kind of grief through the ages and those whom it is forced upon today for whatever reason. It's hard, Heavenly Father, to face the reality of this part of the Christmas story. It's hard, Divine Mother, to have hope when such brutality shows up even as the Prince of Peace comes into the world. Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Thy will be done. Help us. Give us hope. Amen. If you didn't know it before, I guess you do now. One of the hardest, saddest passages of the Bible comes to us as part of the Christmas story. For understandable reasons, we mostly skip over it when telling the story. It's amazing how little known a story can be when it's right here in the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's been here all along. Between the wise men bringing their gifts to baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph settling into their home in Nazareth, the pathetic brutality of a tyrant king invades and disrupts our attempt to find some joy in the world, some hope in these days. We mostly skip over this story, but I think it is important to acknowledge it, especially this year. We're going through some terrible stuff, and we're mostly doing it without being able to be there for each other, at least not like we want to be. Almost 300,000 dead from coronavirus, painful awareness of racial injustice, economic turmoil that has hit the most vulnerable the hardest, if they unfold as now planned, 11 executions by the federal government over the last seven months of the current president, when there were a total of three in the last 30 years. So, especially this year, it makes no sense to ignore the heartbreaking reality of 2,000 years ago, when we have to find a way to deal with the heartbreaking reality that we face today. But not ignoring it doesn't mean dwelling on it or using it to stir emotions like some aid groups use photos of starving children to increase donations by instilling guilt. There's no need to turn it into what they call tragedy porn. Let's just be honest about it. The mass killing happened. 
In the history of the church, it's called the slaughter of the innocents. The children murdered by Herod, no one knows the number. They vary greatly from 20 children to 144,000 in the lore of the church. Those children are said to be the first Christian martyrs. This is part of our story. We recoil at the brutality, grieve the murdered children, in the face of it, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then, with such grief and such honesty held in our hearts and lodged in our bones, we carry on. Christmas happened anyway. With grief and honesty, as a matter of fact, I think there is a great deal of good in the world to remember and celebrate. I know enough to be skeptical of numbers. As Mark Twain popularized, there are three types of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I could probably summon different charts that could tell a different story, but let's look at some of the good in the world. Let's start with one of the most basic realities of all, poverty. In the chart you're looking at now, as you go through time left to right, Green is good, brown is bad. 200 years ago, about 90% of the world's population lived in poverty. Today, it's about 10% of the world's population. This isn't a full picture of economic reality, of course, but that's a wonderful thing. In this one, as you go through time, blue is good and that uh, pinky tan color is bad. 220 years ago, only 10% of the world's population knew how to read. Today, over 90% know how to read. This is not a full picture of educational reality, but that's a wonderful thing. In this one, that greenish, bluish kind of color is good, and orange is bad. 220 years ago, over 40% of children died before age 5. Today, that's less than 5%. This is not a full picture of children's health, but that's a wonderful thing. To get more contemporary and specific about it, this chart shows global deaths from malaria over just the past 20 years. As you can see, the number has been almost cut in half in spite of rapidly rising populations in the affected areas. The percentage has gone down even faster than the sheer numbers. This is, by the way, due in large part to the work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, I have seen children in Angola within days of dying from malaria. So with a broken heart, I can tell you that one child dying from malaria is too many. But this dramatic decline just over the last 20 years is a wonderful thing. On a very different matter, this chart shows the average cost of different sources of energy in North America. Energy generation, of course, being one of the prime drivers of climate change. Those lines that have gone from the highest cost on the left 10 years ago to the lowest cost today the green and dark blue lines, 
Those are wind and solar power, fully sustainable, fully compatible with a living planet forever. This is not a full picture of the energy situation today, but that is a wonderful thing. What other terrible things have dramatically declined over time? Violent crime? People living under autocratic regimes? The number of nuclear weapons? Child labor? The number of children out of school? Deaths from cancer? All of that has dramatically declined over time. This still isn't the full picture of the world's well-being, but all of that makes the world more like Jesus wants it to be. But let me tell you more, closer to home now. About a year ago, we first got to know a woman who has full-time care of four of her grandchildren and who was, at the time, working a barely minimum wage job. The family regularly ran out of food, and this woman couldn't pay for desperately needed medical treatments, treatments that literally kept her alive, with perfectly understandable fears of having her grandchildren taken away. This woman did not seek government support, for which she clearly qualified. Using the experience then of some of our members, the financial resources of our common purse, and the simple compassion of people in this congregation, we helped this woman create a sustainable situation for herself and her grandchildren. Today, no more hunger. No more missed medical treatments. No more fear of eviction. This isn't a full picture of even one life, but it is more like Jesus wants the world to be. For many years, led by the mission ministry, people in the church have helped do page pads as um, they've seeked to work with people who are homeless. When the pandemic hit in March, DuPage County and PADS worked with empty local hotels to house people. This, of course, created new challenges for providing meals to people. The mission ministry partnered with Paul Verant, a terrific local professional chef. They organized a bunch of our members, and they didn't just provide food to those living in hotels, but provided fantastic, nutritious meals. What's more, working with UCECP, they provided some engaging and nurturing early education resources for the children living with those families. You know, it would be better if we had more affordable and supportive housing in DuPage County and so that we could do away with homelessness altogether. But the respect shown to those people with a fantastic meal and creative resources for their wonderful children, that's more like Jesus wants the world to be. In June, when a police officer in Minneapolis knelt on the neck of George Floyd for 8 minutes and 47, 46 seconds, suffocating him to death, so many of us were shocked and angry. Many started paying attention like never before to the racial injustice in our society. But it was difficult, honestly, to start to work through things. But it's work that needed to be done. And since that time, we have led several conversations and provided challenging resources for people, for us to see racial issues more honestly than ever before, to see that white privilege is not some radical myth 
but the everyday reality of our lives. Maybe more were touched by this work, but I can tell you that five people have expressed to me their sense of significant growth, of better self-understanding because of what we have done on the racial justice issue as a congregation. This isn't a full picture of what's going on around us in race, but it's more like Jesus wants the world to be. The pandemic has really disrupted the life of our congregation. But you know what? The church is the people, and the people you are going about the way of your faith. You are caring for each other, supporting each other, grieving with each other, encouraging each other. We have had baptisms, funerals, deathbed visits, drive-by birthday parties, choral music with nobody even in the same room. Faith building for children in never-before-imagined ways, resilient leadership in unprecedented circumstances, and a whole lot of patience and generosity. That's not a full picture of life in our church in pandemic time. Very, very far from it. But it's more like Jesus wants the world to be. So... What's with all this good news? Wonderful, big picture things happening in the world. Beautiful, faithful things happening in Union Church. What's with all of this good news? Well, I offer all of that as a sign of the core proclamation of our Christian faith that death does not have the final word. Herod slaughtered the innocents. And although Jesus was saved that day, 30 years later, he joined those martyred infant brothers and sisters and was slaughtered himself by another Herod. But death did not have the final word. It's clear that Herod can kill, but Herod can't win. It's clear that the Herods, with every ripple of malice that emanates from them still, can cause suffering in the world, but they can't win. Christmas happened anyway. The empty tomb happened anyway. Life happened anyway. Love happened anyway. We can be honest about the slaughter of the innocents because we have a response. Humanity is made in the image of God. Humanity shares in the miracle of Christmas. Humanity lives because the tomb is empty. And Herod can't stop the work of the risen Christ in this world. Even with all of his petty brutality, Herod can't shape the big picture. And in his fearful rage, he can't even stop Union Church. We can be honest about the slaughter of the innocents because we have a response, a response that goes like this. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing.
in the name of the living and active God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we come before you in these challenging times, seeking the comfort of your loving embrace. We pray for all who are suffering in this time of crisis. We ask for your guidance as we navigate uncharted territory. We pray for those who have been afflicted, whether from sickness or loss of loved ones or loss of jobs. We pray for you to comfort those who have not been able to celebrate important life-giving events, including family reunions, weddings, and birthdays. We pray for those who have been unable to visit loved ones in nursing homes and hospitals and for those whose funerals and celebrations of life have been deferred. We especially pray for the day when we can worship together again in your church. Let us have ears to hear and eyes to see your work among us in this world. Open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive your word of your kingdom. And now in this season of Advent, we wait for the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Despite all odds, despite all efforts to interfere, the light of Jesus came into the world and washed away the darkness and planted new life on earth. Let us be the good ground, the good soil, by proper cultivation and understanding of your word. Help us protect the good soil from spiritual enemies. Help us to overcome the obstacles that keep us from being your faithful disciples. Help us to love all others and to serve all others in your name in all that we think and say and do. Gracious God, we pause now to remember and to pray for all who are suffering and to give thanks for the many blessings we have received. When Jesus spoke to the people, he often began with the words, Peace be with you. Because Jesus knows we are a people who often live in fear. We have many fears. Fear of others. Fear of circumstances and events. Fear of losing our health or our jobs. Fear of losing our wealth or possessions fear of losing our lives, fear of the unknown. In his ministry on earth, Jesus constantly reassured, reassured his disciples and others by saying, do not be afraid. And by his death and resurrection, Jesus showed us the reason why we do not need to be afraid. Because Jesus offers us the promise of eternal life. Jesus showed us that the fears we possess in this life 
can be overcome by our faith and by your assurance of eternal life in your kingdom. And now let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As children of God, we know that God calls each of us to share the first fruits of our labors for the benefit of others. And so as we prepare ourselves now to share our tithes and offerings, please remember how many people depend on our generosity, which supports our many church ministries, ministries that are making a life-changing difference for so many. Of course, you may never meet many of those who we help but know that they express their heartfelt gratitude each and every day. At this time, we express our gratitude for all the blessings we enjoy from our gracious God. By sharing our tithes and offerings, as we believe, all that we have is God's abundance. And so, we are returning to God a portion of what God has given us. We are thankful for so many blessings in our lives, and we give these gifts to God with joy and thanksgiving. We are also so grateful to each of you who not only continue to give during these challenging times, but we are especially grateful to those of you who have increased your giving in response to the increased needs of those who depend on us for support. We are grateful beyond words for your extraordinary generosity. As you know, even our collections are being done virtually, so we will pause now to give you a chance to go online to make your donation or to send an email to the church with a donation or to put a check or credit card information in the mail as your offering this morning. As a reminder, you can make a donation online at www.hinsdalechurch.org and click on the Give button. We pause now to receive your offerings, and we make these offerings in Jesus' name, the gifts of God from the people of God. Amen. As many of you know, we have a special offering in celebration of Christmas every year. It is the closest thing we have to giving a gift to Jesus himself on his birthday. This year we have two choices for where you may place your gift. The first is directly with Union Church. If you send a check undesignated or select the Christmas offering Union Church Ministries option on the website, your gift will help to offset the challenges COVID-19 has wrought on our church. We've had some new unique expenses, like upgrading our air filtration system, as well as challenges on the income side with folks unable to honor their pre-pandemic pledge intention. The, section, the second option is directly to our mission partner, Adjust Harvest. By designating so on the memo line of the check, or by selecting Christmas offering Adjust Harvest, that option on the website, you can help support their much needed work. Adjust Harvest is up in Rogers Park and before March, we as a church would purchase food and head up there to serve a meal in their soup kitchen. That of course all changed once the pandemic began. The following is a video that shows how they've adapted to these unique challenges and continue to serve their community in meaningful ways.
we got in those boxes, guys? Watermelon. What's in the boxes? Watermelon. Oh, watermelon. Nice. Watermelon. Beautiful. So, Mark, what are you doing here? So, what we're doing here, we're preparing the boxes to be used. The solution is one gallon of water to a third a cup of bleach. Okay. And since you're spraying it, it, it aerates. Every team is getting eight pounds of meat this week. Nice. Uh, la, la cajita de chest, uh, uh, chest harvest. Ahí estoy aquí abajo con la con la caja. Feel great, you know, when to see you know how many people right now that are not working. Mm -hmm. They need them. They need them. Do you find there's more people who need it now than before? Especially, let me tell you something, especially with some people right now that, that they don't have nothing. Myself feeling great. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, see the, and see the person, you know, when they receive. Yeah. Uh, how, how, I can see on their face, you know, when they say thanks. And I believe, I believe when you give, we're gonna receive.
Christ the everlasting love He shall reign forevermore Noel, Noel Come and see what God has done Will you pray with me? God of grace, our Lord and our Redeemer, we offer these gifts in love and in gratitude for the many blessings we have received. We ask that these gifts be used to further the ministries of your church. May all we do bring praise to your holy name. Amen. so glad that we've had this time in worship today 
as we grow very near now to the wonder of Christmas. I pray that God will continue to be with you in these last few days of the Advent season. God will be with you and yours as Christmas arrives and may it truly be a blessing to you. Remember that after this service now, we will have the opportunity to gather together in fellowship online through Zoom. There should be a link below this video if you're watching on a desktop at least. Maybe there's also a link in the emails that have come home. So join us for that fellowship time, uh, that coffee hour that just like we have had in the past in person, we do now online. As we close today, have hope. For God brings joy to the world, now and always. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.